Pastor Rich is uh, traveling right now. Um, cool. Yeah, it sounds like it's coming through now. Yeah, awesome. Uh, so make sure that we keep him in our prayers. Well, he asked me to teach today. So I, yeah, I'm looking forward to it. I'm hoping that uh, something that God says through me uh, comes out and feeds you guys. We are going to be in the book of Luke. So if you guys want to get prepared, Luke 9, um, verse 57 is where we're going to be at. A couple other verses as well. Uh, Pastor Rich is on a series called The Road After the Resurrection. And yes, last week when he was teaching, um, a couple things stood out to me. Before we get started on that, though, uh, we're in spring, but summer's right around the corner, right? We talked about the possible summer camp that we're going to be doing as a church. I uh, got to thinking for myself, since summer is around the corner, there's all kinds of summer activities that people do. When I was growing up, my family always did the family vacations. So we would go somewhere, California, Vegas. Um, we went to Florida once. My sister, she really got a younger sister, and uh, she really likes roller coasters. She really likes theme parks. So when we went to Florida, the plan was to go into Orlando, and she wanted to go to um, one of the amusement parks there. I'm not a fan of uh, theme parks, roller coasters, any of that stuff. So I figured I'd go visit one of my friends that was in Florida. He had just went out there to go to school at Full Sail, um, which is a music school. Since I was in Orlando, I hit him up and I was like, hey, bro, let's hang out on this day because my sisters and my family are going to be at the theme park and I don't do that. So he's like, all right, cool. Tells me where his address is at. Now, this is before Uber, before Lyft. This is when they had the yellow taxis with the black back seats, the Crown Royals. So my family gets to the theme park and I go find me a taxi. I'm born and raised in Albuquerque. Find the taxi and the taxi driver says, where do you need to go? So I give him the address. Once I give him the address, he's like, all right, do you want to take the toll roads or no? And in my head, I'm hearing toll roads, that's extra fees. No, I don't want to pay extra fees. He's like, all right, I'll take the back roads then. So he starts taking the back roads. It's about a 30 minute drive from the theme park to my buddy's apartment complex. When I get to the apartment complex, he tells me, all right, here's your tab. It was like 70 bucks. I was like, shoot. My buddy had told me that this ride was only going to cost me like $20. How come it jumped all the way up to 70? Whatever I paid him just because I wasn't going to run out of the taxi without paying, right? I get to my buddy's apartment and I'm like, yo, bro, the taxi cost me like 70 bucks. What the heck? And he's like, oh, you took the back roads, didn't you? I was like, yeah, the other option was taking toll roads. And who does that? Like, what are those? He's like, well, toll roads are like highways. You pay a toll and you get on the highway so that you can get places quicker. I was like, oh, so I probably would have saved some money then if I had got on the, paid the toll road and just rode that way. He's like, yeah, that's a total of the 20 bucks that I told you about. I was like, shoot. All that to say that when we're walking with Christ, there's some costs that we actually have to absorb. Jesus paid everything for us. He paid it with his life. He's the originator and the perfecter of our faith. But he requires us to pay some fees along the way of this road. That led me to the cost of following Jesus. So if you're able to, please stand with me or read the word of God. It says, as they were walking along, someone said to Jesus, I'll follow you no matter where you go. But Jesus replied, Foxes have no dens to live in, and birds, oh, I'm sorry, foxes have dens to live in, and birds have nests. But I, the Son of Man, have no home of my own, not even a place to lay my head. He said to another person, Come, be my, be my disciple. The man agreed, but he said, Lord, first let me return home and bury my father. Jesus replied, let those who are spiritually dead care for their own dead. Your duty is to go and preach the coming of the kingdom of God. Another said, yes, Lord, 
I'll follow you. But first, let me say goodbye to my family. But Jesus told him, anyone who puts a hand to the plow and then looks back is not fit for the kingdom of God. Y'all can be seated. Holy Father, we come before you, opening up your word to learn. Thank you so much for this community. Thank you so much for the leader of this church. We lift up Pastor Rich and his wife as they travel. We ask that you would just fill them as they worship together. God, as they spend this time together, let them draw closer to you. And let us draw closer to you. I pray and ask that in these next few moments that we spend together, that our relationship with you would be more tight in. That our walk with you would be more in sync. Father God, I thank you for everybody that's in this building right now and watching online. I pray a blessing over their life. I pray and ask that you would use me. Speak through me as you see fit. Thank you so much for this day. You are mighty. And in that we say, Amen. The title of my message is The Toll on the Road. The road that we are walking, there is a toll that we have to take. Cost that we have to pay to follow Jesus. This portion of the scripture part that stood out to me the most was that anyone who puts a hand to the plow and then looks back is not fit for the kingdom of God. Hand to the plow. We don't really do too much of that unless you're on a farm right now or unless you've been around a farm. But that's how they would cut out the grooves, till the land. And in these times, the land is how they made their money. It was either farming, shepherding, or fishing. So, anyone who put their hand to the plow and then looks back is not fit for the kingdom of God. When I read that, I was taken back because it's important that when we give our life to God, we've accepted the work that He has called us to do. Before the world was created, each one of you was made for a specific purpose. God knew your name. It says in the Bible that He knew you before He stitched you in your mother's womb. He has a plan for your life. He has a plan for something specific that only you can do for His kingdom. That's your field. That's the work that you're supposed to be doing. It comes in many different forms. Other books in the Bible gives the gifts, right? How you do the work is up to you. How you walk the road after the resurrection, after you've given your life to God, is up to you. You can't look back when you've given your life to God. You can't look back to Egypt. You can't look back to the work that you've already done. You've got to keep your head going forward. There's many different examples of this in the Bible. But I just want you to take a moment and think about your own life. You've had certain experiences. You've had certain skill sets gifted to you. And God wants to use them for His glory, for His kingdom. Part of the cost, the toll on our road, is saying, Lord, I'm not going to use my gifts for my own benefit, but for your benefit. I've had the gift of gab my whole life. I used to get in trouble for talking. I used to get in trouble for telling stories. And then I found out, oh, I just wasn't doing it the right way. I was trying to get attention. I was trying to draw things to me. That's not what this gift was meant for. This gift was meant so that God could speak through me and He could draw people to Him. Your gift is that. A gift that can be drawn, a gift that people can be drawn to God through. It's not meant for you to take full credit of for you to take the full pay for. What it's meant for is for you to watch 
how God uses you and enjoy the walk. When we walk with Jesus, there's all kinds of different things that we can see. You've had your own experiences, and in my experience, man, there are certain moments in my life where I just knew it was God. There are certain times that, well, I'll be honest, I made some very bad decisions when I was growing up. And to be around today, I think back about those decisions, and I'm reminded, huh, it wasn't me who made it through that time. God, you had already created a way because you knew I was going to make bad decisions. You knew how I was going to mess up even before I messed up and you planned a way for me to get out of it. Now that's the negative decisions, right? And there's positive decisions too. Where I've heard the Spirit talk to me and be like, hey Nico, go do this. And I listened and I walked on that road. And the blessings that came, they were abundant. My life was enriched. There's this feeling inside of me that just wants to explode because there's no other way that it would have happened but God. The cost that we must pay, the our toll for walking this road, is simple. It's the choices that we make on a daily basis. When we start our day, how do we start it? Are we giving our first time of the day to God? Are we saying thank you to Him for allowing us to even have the day? Because it's not ours. He created it for you to do a specific thing in that day, to have a specific interaction, to bless someone specifically. Whether it's at your job, whether it's at school, whether it's inside your household, there's a specific role that you have to complete that day, and that's why He gave you breath that morning. Your toll is choosing, all right, Lord, thank you. I'm going to walk this path because the other path, it costs three times more. This toll that we have to pay, again, I'm not taking anything away from Jesus. Jesus paid it all, but He's requiring us to do certain things as we walk with Him. It says in the Bible that the kingdom to heaven has a narrow path. And I used to think we had to walk that alone, but we don't. You see, when we're walking head first, Jesus is walking backwards like, yo, I got you. Come on. Keep on going. It's just us two walking on this narrow path. And each of us has to take his hands. Say, yes, I'm going to follow you. Yes, I'm going to walk this path with you today, no matter how tight it might get. No matter what's on the side of the road, because sometimes the side of the road is going to be really pretty. Sometimes the side of the road is going to be really thorny. But you are required to walk with God directly towards it towards Him. Because Jesus is the one that knows the path. Jesus is the one that made the path for you. He is God in man's in flesh. He came down here and said, hey, come on. I'm going to go through what you guys go through. He lamented over Lazarus. Cried. That was his friend. He grieved. <laughs> Earlier in this scripture in chapter 9, I was cracking up because he had just rebuked his three closest disciples. You see in chapter 9, I believe it's uh, verse 28, the transfiguration happens. And Jesus goes up to the mountain and he starts talking to his father. And he takes Peter, John, and James with him. And they all fall asleep. And it says... In chapter 9, that two others came to join Jesus. It's believed to be Elijah and Moses. They joined him there. And Peter awakens and says, Lord, this is amazing. Look at you. Your clothes are dazzling. Your face is just illuminating. Let us make a shelter here. 
And there are times that shelter was a shrine. All right? We'll make three, Peter says. One for each one of you. It also says in that portion that God comes and puts a cloud around them and tells them, this is my son, you listen to him. Basically saying, unless Jesus tells you to do it, don't do it. Part of the toll that we have to walk is listening to Jesus and Jesus only. Peter gets rebuked in that situation. They come down from the mountain and the rest of the disciples are down there, right? Chapter 9 continues on and it says that there's a man, a father there with his son who's demon-possessed. And the demon-possessed son, they brought him because his father has such a love for his child that he just wants him back. You may have a child like that. You may even be the child like that. Your parents are just wanting you back in the arms of Jesus. Wanting their kid back. It says that the other disciples, the father says, your other disciples couldn't do it. And Jesus says, you stubborn, faithless people. How long must I put up with you? Bring them here. He rebukes his other disciples because they aren't walking the path that Jesus asked them to walk. He continues on and tells them after that portion, this one requires more prayer. This one requires more time with me. This type of spirit, you got to be really close to me in order to cast out. There's some other examples that I found of people turning back. Because if you are going to take this path after the resurrection, you can't look back. In Matthew 8.22, this same scripture is harmonized. You can turn there if you want to, but you don't have to. In this scripture, though, the verse that I want to point out is that Jesus still says the foxes in the dens portion. And another disciple says, Lord, first let me return and bury my father. But Jesus told him, follow me now. That's the big difference that I noticed when I was studying these two versions of this same story. It's an immediate action. There's moments in our lives that when we're on this walk, we have to take an immediate action towards Christ. And that's the first point. The monetary cost. Again, because when you're working the field in those days, if you didn't do a fool's day's worth of work, you weren't going to get a full day worth of pay. If you didn't stay on the fishing boat and do what you needed to do, then you weren't going to get paid. That's how they earn their cash. God has many blessings for each one of you through the gifts that He has given you. Without fully living in those gifts, you're not receiving those blessings. There's a monetary cost that comes to that. In today's day and age, cash is something that we have to work with. And you get cash for providing a product or service. And guess who gave you the skills to do the products or the services? Our Almighty Father. So if you're not using all the gifts that He gave you, and He's not going to give you the full abundant reward. Your choice on this road is to use each and every gift that He has given you. The second portion that stood out to me when I was kind of working through this sermon was the social cost. And for this one, I'm going to reference Genesis 19.26. Give you a little bit of context around Genesis 19.26. This is when uh, Sodom and Gomorrah is being taken out by God. And Lot, the nephew of Abram, is still in Sodom and Gomorrah. 
Abram is Abraham before he got renamed by God. And Abram says, Lord, I know they're wicked people, but my nephew's over there. Will you at least spare him? Because of Abraham's connection to God, because of his walk with God, because of the tolls that he's paid to stay in connection with God, God listens to him and honors his request. He says, no problem. I'll spare your nephew, but he needs to get out of that city. So God sends two angels down into Sodom and Gomorrah, and these two angels are in the middle of the town square, and Lot goes and sees him. He's like, oh yeah, I know that you're of God. Come stay at my house. And they're like, no, no. We're here to do some work. But Lot says, no, come stay with me. So he brings him in and there's some other things that happen in that story. Eventually, the angels tell him, look, you need to get out of here. You need to leave because we have work to do and you're holding us up. So get. Go into the mountains so we can do what we came here to do. <laughs> Lot says, no, 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 I don't want to go into the mountain. Send me into that little village over there instead because that's, that's going to be better. He tells his two daughters, fiancés, like, come on, let's go. God's going to knock out this city. And they're like, nah, you're crazy. We're gonna, we don't care about your daughters. We don't care about any of that. Go. In this message, I'm sure that you guys have heard it. They're leaving, and the city's on fire. It's being taken out by God. It's angels. And Lot's wife turns around and looks at it. She turns to a pillar of salt. She couldn't walk the path and pay the toll of not turning back. I'm sure that Lot had some social costs there by losing your wife. Because in that day and age, you needed a wife. You needed to reproduce. It's one of the first things that God tells us to do. There's a social cost that you may have to pay when you're walking this road with God. I'm sure we could all think about a time where we've said that we believe in God and one of our friends, one of our family members, one of our co-workers kind of chuckled at us like, oh, you believe in that stuff? As if it's some tale or story. Lot lost his wife. There's a social cost that comes with walking this road with Jesus. Because again, it's a very narrow road. For the men in here, you're supposed to lead on that path. And for the women, you're supposed to follow a man who is being led by God. When I gave my life to God, I was running around people who didn't believe in God. I was hanging out with people who didn't uh, follow the laws. And I was blessed enough to be raised by parents who raised me in the church. They had me memorize the books of the Bible. They took me to church on Sunday morning and Wednesday night. They made sure that I was there sitting and worshiping. And a lot of times I was disgruntled about it. Stubborn little kid, didn't even know why we were here singing these songs. Why we were here doing these things on Sunday when Sunday I could be sleeping in watching my cartoon. Tom and Jerry was on. I'm so grateful for that foundation that they laid because when I got off the road of following Jesus, that was one of the only reasons why I was able to get back on. It wasn't by my own might. It was by choices. I had to change my choices on a consistent basis. And for me, it was hour by hour. All right, Lord, what would you like me to do here? Really? Okay, let's go. All right, Lord, I don't know what to do here. What would you like me to do? Okay, let's go. Step by step, I had to learn how to hold his hands and walk this road after my soul got resurrected. 
That's what we talk about when we give our life to God. We actually give up our old life and we receive a gift of new life from God. And that path right there, that gift of new life, might be in the same skin, bones, might be in the same environment, but your soul is resurrected. There's a social cost that comes with walking with Jesus. <laughs> when I made my decision, I was seeing this uh, young lady, right? Me and her have been together for a little bit of time. And I was like, Lord, I don't know what to do because she only goes to church because I go to church. And uh, when we're told to stand up and greet other people, she don't do it. She crosses her arms and sits down. She won't pray with me. And she gets bugged that I read. But I really like her. I thought she was the one. She fits all my boxes. Me and her are trying to sort this out. And we're sitting on my couch, and we had just got finished arguing about something. Something dumb. I can't even remember what it is. But I'm crying out to God, like, what do you want me to do? What am I supposed to do here in this situation now? Because I wasn't counting this cost. I figured she would just follow along. No, she has her own choices to make. God tells me, let her go. I have something better for you. I get excited. I'm like, oh, you got something better for me? Man, this one fits all the boxes, so I could only imagine what you got. There's a social cost because we were in the same social circles. I don't bring too many people around my family, but she was one of two that came to one of my family gatherings. So in my head, I was like, man, I've already like committed in front of my family that this is one of the one of the ones that I'm really serious about. What am I going to do there? At the time, I thought it was, uh, no, let me put it this way. At the time, for me, it was part of my identity to have, be in a relationship, right? Like you have to have somebody. No, you don't. Single's a number. And it's a whole number. And guess what? Single with God, means that he gets more of your time. He gets to develop those gifts. He gets to develop those blessings. And then when he sees that you can serve him better with somebody alongside you, guess what? He gives you somebody. It's a new blessing that he gives you. You see, because walking this path, yes, there's cost, but there's also rewards. There was drama associated with her. <laughs> I don't have to worry about that anymore. I get these new blessings. Because some of the women that I've seen afterwards, if they don't meet certain criteria, then they can't be around me. They're part of that thorny side that's on the path. No matter how pretty those thorns are, there's a social cost that comes with following Jesus. Now, just like Lot paid it, you may have to pay it. It may be that intimate relationship that you're in. It may be that close friend because my middle school friends, my high school friends, they ain't around anymore. I got a whole new group of friends, though. And they're focused on Jesus. And they're walking their own path. I'm reminded of like two cars. You ever, guys ever seen? It's Albuquerque. I'm sure you've seen it. Two cars racing down Montgomery, <laughs> racing down Manal, racing down 4th Street. Or it might even be two low, ride, low riders, right? Cruising at the same speed. It's nice to have friends who are headed in the same direction at the same speed. They're staying in their lane with Christ and walking. God knows that you need community. He built us that way. But part of the community that He's going to give you requires you walking your path, paying your toll each and every time that you take a step. Or God, 
I want to go here. Is it okay? No, son. Go here instead. He's going to give you somebody in that new arena, in that new environment, because he knows he built us to have community, so he's going to give you the community that he wants you in so that your gifts can be developed for his glory. I'm reminded of Moses right now. Moses had his brother Aaron. And at the beginning where Moses is called to return back to Egypt, because God gave him the gift of being raised in Egypt, being trained in Egypt, so he could learn and know their system. God calls him back, and Moses is like, no. He gives God a bunch of excuses. I'm, I'm, I'm humble. God's like, I don't care. I got I'm this, I'm that. God's like, I don't care. I told you to go back to Egypt because you need to speak on my behalf to Pharaoh. Moses fights with God. I love that part because it makes me feel a little bit better when I have my arguments with God. <laughs> Lord, I don't want to do that. Lord, I don't want to go around these people. Lord, that path looks way too tight for me to fit through. He's like, no, I said it's okay, so you go. God eventually says, all right, fine. Your brother Aaron, he's going to go with you. He's coming now. Look for him. Moses and Aaron must have been pretty tight, right? They had to walk together. They had to go to Egypt. They had to do all these things. I'm sure that Moses understood the social cost when he came back down from the mountain and he saw that Aaron had listened to all the people and built the golden calf. My brother, the one that God gave me, is now the one that listened to all these people instead? There's a social cost there. Moses had his own social cost too, shoot. Think about it. He didn't listen to God when God told him, hey, tap that rock. Instead, he struck the rock. And God was like, sorry, son. You can't go into my promised land now. That's a social cost. Everybody that he had led, everybody that he knew, he had to watch them go ahead into this promised land while he sat back and ended his life. Not like taking his own life, but he had to end out his life on his own. Social cost. The greats paid it. The third point that I have for you guys today comes out of John 21, 17. It's where Pastor Rich was reading from last week. One of the things that was just so profound to me about last week's message, if you didn't, weren't here or you didn't see it, go check it out online. Was well, that Peter, the one who walked on water because he focused on Jesus, he walked his path when he climbed off that boat and he took a couple steps, eyes focused on Jesus, he was able to walk on water. Paid the cost and he went back to the way that he used to live. And this time, he had to jump out of the boat and swim in the water way further distance to go meet Jesus again. In this text, Jesus knows how Peter is feeling emotionally down, right? So he's trying to build him up. But the way that God works is far greater than anything we'll ever understand. We're really not supposed to. Again, we're supposed to just listen and follow our steps where he tells us to. Make the choice to follow where he's walking, where he's guiding you. It may look weird, it may look awkward, and it may hurt, but it's an emotional cost. Jesus asked Peter, do you love me? After he fed him, after he took care of him, do you love me, Peter? Peter's like, yes, Lord, I love you.
God, I think he had like that cool pause in between. Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord, I love you. The third time that he says it, he adds in a phrase. I think you get points when you preach and you can teach a Greek word. But he adds in a a phrase that says, do you love me more than all these things? So I looked up what things meant in the concordance. Things in Greek is pronounced two-toned. And it's the term that's used for everything. All persons, all things, anything material or people. And in the third time that Peter is asked by Jesus, Peter, do you love me more than all these things? You could kind of read it in the text that Peter's hurt. Like, Lord, why are you asking me so many times? I already said once that I loved you. I already gave my life to you. I already said twice that I loved you. Yes, I'm walking the road that you have me for. Why are you asking me again? God wants to know that when you're walking this path with Him, that your attention is fully focused on Him. God was just redirecting His eyes back to Him. Like they were when He was walking on the water. He's saying, Peter, do you love me more than everything else? Because you went back. You went back to that old life. You went back to that old relationship. You went back to that old habit. Do you love me more than all that? Or is that greater than me? This path that each of you is called to walk with your gifts that He blessed you with may come with an emotional cost. The work that I do, people love to give me kudos for. And it really irks me. It irks me because I know God has a purpose for my life. But if I had listened a little bit earlier, how different it could be. If I chose to walk the path that God called me to walk earlier in my life, how many more blessings would I have been able to live through? Don't get me wrong, man. The experiences that I have had, they've built me into the person that I am. But I think God didn't want me to go through some of the things that I went through. I think He wanted me to walk this path, this narrow path with Him at a far younger age. Not because what He was going to do was different, but so that I could receive more blessings. Like I said at the beginning, He has a plan for each one of your lives. He knows what He's going to do. Are you going to choose to receive the blessings as soon as possible? Or are you going to put them off and wait and wait and wait? He has blessed everybody in the Bible. And He did everything that He wanted to with each one of the people named in here. What comes to mind right now is Samson. Samson was supposed to go and judge a certain group of people. And Samson got distracted. He had one specific distraction that he had in his life, right? Along with many other ones. Just like most of us do. There's that one big distraction that you have in life that is one of these two tones. It's one of these things. Like God's saying, do you love me more than that? Samson, do you love me more than Delilah? He's calling us to walk this path with Him as soon as possible. He wants to guide you because He knows what's best for you.
Samson judged those people. He killed them all. But I'm sure that Samson would have received a lot more blessings had he not been fooling around with Delilah the whole time. Your gifts are built for a specific purpose inside the kingdom. Those gifts that God gave you, that you didn't get on your own, that you were blessed with, were created so that you could receive a blessing. When you choose to receive those blessings is up to you. But the work that you are called to do through those gifts will be done. There's no doubt about that. The Scriptures have it. The road after the resurrection, Jesus paid it all, all of our sins. We can't do anything to wipe our own stains. Jesus took care of that. Jesus paid all the costs, and he's preparing a place for you in his Father's house. In that beautiful place that we call heaven. What he's asking you is will you pay just a little bit of a toll to walk with me, please? Will you please just walk this narrow path with me? I know what I have for you. Will you please just follow me as I walk backwards because I know the path. Will you just hold my hands and take each step? I know it's going to be difficult. That's why I came. I took care of all the hard work. You just have to pay these small little tolls on a daily basis. That's all I want you to do. Be with me. Spend time with me. Learn to hear my voice so that when you are in those thorny paths, you'll hear me and you'll know which way to step. So when you are on those pretty paths, there's lots of things on each side that want to draw your attention away. You'll hear my voice when I say, no, keep on walking. Because I have something better for you. I have something that I have called you to. Peter was emotionally grieved when God asked him those three times. But I think it was a reminder to Peter. Because some of us, we don't listen to the, the kind gestures, right? Some of us, we need to remember the pain. Sometimes we may even have scars to remind us of what's going on. Remind us of the times that we didn't listen to him, so we got hurt. And in his goodness and his grace, he healed us and said, come on, walk this path with me. You won't be hurt like that. There's an emotional cost after the road when you choose to follow Jesus. We see it in the Bible. And you could probably see it in your own seat, in your own life. Monetary cost. It may be that that job isn't what's right for you. That role isn't what's right for you. And oh, you're going to have to take a pay cut? Cool. Do you know who created that job for you? Do you know who created the next job for you? His name's Jesus, and he's asking you to walk the path with him. There may be a social cost. You may lose all these friends that you have around. Shoot, you may even be, you may even be scorned by your family. I bet you that's what this man was thinking when he said, yes, Lord, I will follow you, but first let me say goodbye to my family. Let me go bury my father. Because if I don't show up to the funeral, you know what my family's going to think? Jesus is like, I don't care what they think. What about me? Do you care what I think? There may be a social cost that comes in this walk that you're choosing to take. 
And if you haven't chose to take it, I'm going to give you an opportunity here at the end of the message to take it. But there's a social cost that comes with following Jesus. Countless people I've seen come and go for my life. Those social costs, that one hurts me. Well, it hurts me even more to think that I'm going to be missing out on what Jesus has for me. That's what hurts me the most. So when that fear of missing out starts to play its little tune inside of my head, because that's my biggest thing, I'm missing out on this, I'm missing out on that. I remind myself, I can't miss out on holding the hands of Jesus and walking with Him. So let me get in my scripture. Let me get in my prayers. Let me start speaking the word over me because that's my sword. That's what He gave me. So I'm going to use it. There may be a cost that's emotional. Oh, it's going to hurt sometimes to follow Jesus. It's going to hurt inside to follow Jesus sometimes. It's going to hurt your mental but he's doing that so that you can be reminded of his unfailing love. Because there's an emotional blessing that comes with following Jesus. There are some things, some joys that you're going to find in life that can only come from following Jesus. Those emotional blessings, they're nothing compared to the cost. Nothing at all. All he wants to know is, are you going to love me more than all these things? Are you going to be with me before you choose to be with all these other things? Because by the way, I created them. You can't miss out on something that he has planned for you. But what you can miss out on is all the blessings that he has planned for you because you're not walking the path with him. And if you're not walking the path with Him, then He can't bless you. He can't direct you to that next blessing and say, here you go, child. This is what I have. You've been doing great. You've been walking with me. Here, look. Check this out. Our world loves to say, take the unbeaten path. They say that because there's different perspectives. There's different things that you can see. God doesn't want you to walk a path that is already walked. He has a specific path for you to walk. And the cool part about it is that when you start walking that path, other people notice it. They start walking on that path too. And then Jesus meets them. And Jesus says, come on. Do you like this path? Let's go. I got one for you too. Our God is a good God. He came and paid it all for us. All He asks is, will you give up all these things for Him? Father God, we come before You. Thank You for a message today. Thank You for the examples that we have. Thank you for the answers that this book gives us. Thank you for sending your son, Jesus. And Jesus, thank you for knowing the exact path that we should be walking on. Thank you for making one out for us. Even though we have weary legs, even though we have wayward minds, even though we get distracted, they're always there. Thank you for paying all the costs, O oh Lord. I pray and ask that each one of the souls in this building that hears it online, they don't see the toll as an extravagant fee, but merely as an investment in walking with you. For your reward is greater. Your reward is new life. an eternal life in Your presence. But we don't have to feel pain. We don't have to feel heartache. 
We don't have to live in these corroding bodies. I get to be with you. For it says in your word that there's no sun because you're the light. Lord God, let us search for how we can stay on path with you. Search for your hands as we walk. For you called us all by name. With everybody's head bowed, if you're concerned about if you're walking on that path, God made it very easy for us. He gave us His Son who came and died on a cross, mutilated. Horrible death. So that you didn't have to go through that. So that all you have to do is say, I believe in Jesus. I believe He is my Savior and my Lord. I believe He has a right path for me. Give you a brief opportunity to assess your heart. And if that's something that you know you need to rededicate, you need to even do it for the first time, please raise your hand. Join us in this kingdom family where he created a path for you. Lord God, I thank you for everybody in this building. I praise you for every soul here. I thank you for the blessings that you have given them. I pray and ask that you would open up their hearts, open up their minds, so that they can use the gifts that you have given them and receive the abundant blessings that you have coming from your kingdom. For you are the creator of all. We thank you for your son, Jesus. We thank you for your Holy Spirit. We ask to be guided by it. Lord God, I pray for Pastor Rich and Jess as they travel. Pray for everybody else's family who's traveling and who's not here. And Lord God, I pray for all the souls who are off the path. The men and women in this building, be an example. Be an example of holding Jesus' hands and walking with Him. I thank you so much for what you're going to bring this week. I thank you for all the blessings that you're going to bring this week. And I pray and ask that when that choice happens, they'll be reminded of your word today. That choose to follow Jesus in it. And Lord God, I pray an extra special blessing when that happens. That there's no other doubt than it was Jesus who gave this to me. Because He gave His all for us. And all He asks is for us to choose to follow Him. I thank You, Almighty King, for Your goodness. I thank You for Your grace and Your mercy. I thank You so much for Your love that never ends and never changes. Thank You so much for this time that we got together. It's in your son's name, Jesus, that I pray. Amen.